Nicola, can you hear me? Yep, I just about to start, Edwin, if you put yourself on mute. No problem at all. Can you see Brilliant. me? Yes, I can see you. Yep, oh, that's yep. great, that's great. Okay. Okay, good evening everyone and welcome to the Ulster Farmers Union 2021 Virtual Women in Agriculture Conference Part 2. You're most welcome and we're delighted to have so many logged on to join us this evening. It is much appreciated and we hope you take away from it some brilliant information from our wonderful speakers this evening. Now, I'm not sure how many of you were tuned in last week, so if you were, you'll have to forgive me if I go over a little bit of the same ground. First of all, I'd like to introduce myself. My name is Nicola Weir and I present Farming Matters on BBC Radio Ulster on a Tuesday evening. That's 6 p.m. to 7 p.m. and you can listen again on BBC Sounds. That's right, I'm advertising. Who wouldn't with this kind of captured audience? Now I've been with the BBC almost 20 years. I know I don't look that old enough and I've worked on such programs as Good Morning Ulster, Evening Extra, Talk Back, BBC Newsline, Spotlight, and the Stephen Nolan Show, both on TV and radio, and I hope you do forgive me for that. But I managed to escape his clutches in 2019, and now I present the biggest show in the country, and that is Farming Matters. And I also produce Gardener's Corner on a Saturday morning, so it really goes hand in hand. Now, I've been have had farming in my blood on both sides of my family. My One of my grandfathers was a pig farmer and the other one was a dairy and a beef farmer. And I spent many a blissful weekend and summer holiday helping them milk the cows or round them up or observe the piglets, probably getting in their way more than I was helping them. And my grandmother also loved raising turkeys on for Christmas, which she gave away as Christmas presents. Now, isn't that a great idea? to avoid all those crushes at Christmas time in the shops. But as I said last week, it taught me about where my food was from, how much time and effort and love was put into the livestock and about the sheer hard work, hard work involved by all our farmers. And I think it is extremely important for all children to learn about farming, food, agriculture and rural life, instead of sometimes the unqualified nonsense that is often spread through social media. And the Ulster Farmers Union play a big part in this, uh, giving some of this brilliant knowledge to our young people. And again, I commend them for their Dig It project for primary school children that I urge you all to take a look at. Now I live on a farm just outside Ballymena and I'm married to Peter, 
Again, I'm going to stress it is not Peter Weir, the education minister, so please don't send me any emails. I cannot pass them on. And I adore living in the countryside and having the most amazing unobstructed views of the fields as far as the eye can see. Now, my father-in-law, he is retired, but his brother is still sheep farming and I love seeing the lambs out in our backyard. And it inspired me, believe it or not, to train as a sheep shearer, something else that you're learning about me tonight. And before you ask, I'm not that good. And it would take me probably a week to do about 10 sheep. So please don't call me, okay? So now you find out a little bit more about me, it's time to find out a little bit more about the influential and engaging woman and man who will be talking to you tonight. But before I introduce our first speaker, I'll do a little bit of housekeeping for you. This evening is being recorded, everyone, and a link will be sent out via the uh, post this event uh, to watch again if you wish. So just keep an eye on that coming into you. Questions, if you have them, should be through the Q&A button at the bottom of the screen. Please do not use the chat button, okay? Please ask any questions you want and we will direct as many as we can to our speakers. This is your opportunity to get as much information as you can from our three speakers this evening. So please do take that opportunity with both hands. There will be a survey at the end, so please complete so we can keep giving you the best that we can do and keep improving with some of these sessions. And we expect the session to this evening to last no longer than one and a half hours. And the charity we are supporting this evening is Life Beyond, and there will be an opportunity to donate to it via a Just Giving link. Right, so that's all out of the way to our first speaker of the evening, none other than Minister for Agriculture, Environment and Rural Affairs, Edwin Putz. Now, Edwin is from a farming background himself, and he was appointed to minister in January 2020. And although faced with unparalleled challenges, he has seized the opportunities to identify and progress key environmental issues and enhance the agri-food sector in Northern Ireland. I also want to highlight that we thank him very, very much for taking the time to speak to us this evening as he has publicly battled cancer in recent months, but is hopefully on the mend now. And Mr. Putz has kindly agreed to speak to us this evening regarding the vital role played by women in the agricultural sector, as well as the role of his department in supporting women in the industry. And I'm most interested to hear about this. Might be something I can use in Farming Matters. So without further ado, Mr. Putz, it's over to you. Thank you very much, Nicola. You must have started with uh, the, the BBC very young, if you've been there for 19 years. But in any event, uh, it's good to be able to join with you and, and indeed with uh, all of the women that, that are with us tonight. And uh, I thank you for the invitation uh, to come and join yourselves and commend you in organising this event um, during these difficult times. And it's a great example of how we as a society can adapt to the ever-changing circumstances we we'll find ourselves in as a result of COVID-19. And holding events virtually does allow us to continue to deliver our important business objectives, but in a safe manner. The importance of women in agriculture um, can't be overstated. The importance of, of women in my life can't be overstated. Um, I was brought up, up obviously, uh, uh, in a rural um, background. And in that home, uh, I had my mother and two sisters. And, uh, my dad was away at the cattle markets a lot. And I also had an auntie who stayed with us on a very regular basis. She was a single lady. Uh, so women's influence in my life um, has been huge, um, has been beneficial. Uh, many a time I went out with mum to feed the calves um, when I was a wee boy. Um, she would have come out when I, when I was older and, and, and farming and taken a look around them and, and said, Edwin, there's one there need, need, needs a wee bit of an injection. And uh, her attention to detail was excellent. Um, again, with, with the sheep and lambing the sheep and, and collecting eggs, um, put in a massive effort in spite of a lot of ill health. And I go back to what my father said about my grandmother. Um, there was uh, 10 children, and very often there were 16 there because there was a couple of men working on the farm. Um, but there were 16 there for, for, for food. And uh, she had made them all a fry in the mornings. and done the washing and went out and, and, and uh, been stuck in hay or, or pulling flax, um, whatever needed to be done. And these women's roles um, over the years uh, have probably not uh, been given the credit um, that, that they should have. 
I know that for many farms, the, the women's role, particularly in doing boot work uh, and, and providing um, a lot of the work around the farm almost went unseen uh, and certainly not, not that well recognised. And, and that wasn't a good thing. And I'm thankful that over recent years, uh, women's um, contribution right across the agri-sector agri has become better recognised and it continues to grow in its influence. And I'd like to share with you some of the important roles women have had in agriculture over the years, which I hope will demonstrate uh, the progression women have made uh, in my department. Back in the late 1950s, women were embarking on roles such as poultry, poultry lecturer with Valerie Sloan and providing technical staff in the field of dairy milk production. Margaret Torrens in Greenmount College, for example, um, I was from a beef and dairy background. Um, Margaret taught me how to milk cows um, whenever I went to Greenmount um, because it wasn't something that I was previously doing and uh, she wouldn't have been too long putting me right. The first se senior principal veterinary office uh, Margaret Fuor was appointed in the department in 1990 and on to play a lead role in the development of pol policies on bovine TB and set the direction of the eradication of brucellosis from Northern Ireland. And this pivotal role led the way for um, many other female vets taking up senior roles within DERA today. Women continued to fulfil senior roles within the department in 1996. It had its two first assistant secretaries, the senior civil service cadre, Pauline McCloy and Evelyn Cummins. At that time, these appointments resulted in females representing just 8% of the top management team. And thankfully, those figures have risen significantly from then. And today, they make up 28% of the top management team. We'll have a, a gender champion um, in the civil service, Fiona McCandless, from my department, uh, who is an excellent player uh, in our team. But I remain acutely aware that some sectors of agriculture can be perceived as being historically male dominated. Therefore, my department is keen to promote and advocate viable careers for women. For example, the modern day forestry service embraces an extensive and diverse range of activities and professions that appeal equally to both women and men. Increasing awareness of opportunities for women is key to making the difference. And this is recognized by forestry professional bodies such as the Institute of Chartered Foresters, who are highlighting the role of women in the industry via its Look Like a Forester initiative. And in the coming months, my department intends to recruit a number of new forest officers. And I firmly believe that women can bring a great deal to this sector and to the department through opportunities such as these. On a recent analysis out of our 3,175 staff within DERA, uh, the female workforce is 1,415 which equates to 46 of the workforce, and again emphasises the vital contribution women are making in all aspects of the sector, in developing policy legislation and decision making, which is impacting on the agri agricultural landscape of our country. Evidence of the continuation of growing trend of female participation in the agriculture sector is reflected in the number of young women who are undertaking professional qualifications at CAFRI. Over the previous five years, a vast majority of courses offered to students have seen a steady growth in female enrolment. Uh, whenever I went to Greenmount, there was seven, seven females out of, I think, about 160 of us at that stage. Uh, and, and it has now um, went up um, in terms of female representation from 30.5% in 2017 to 53% in 2021. Whilst the Master of Science Honours degree in Agri Technology, offered in conjunction with Queen's University of Belfast, has also experienced an increase in female representation from 32% in 2017 to 53% in 2021. Over the last five years, <coughs> it shows us that the number of females enrolled in all CAFRI agricultural courses has increased from 19 to 28.4%. And these figures represent the very welcome and growing interest and active engagement of young women in the agriculture sector in Northern Ireland, what will undoubtedly increase the influence they will play in the agricultural environment and the future. There is support for rural development, while it's not aimed specifically at women in agriculture, does provide for significant annual investment in sustainability and growth of rural areas through support for businesses, communities and families. This includes investment in tackling rural poverty and social isolation, which supports rural travel family farm health checks and social prescribing, 
Areas that are traditionally managed and addressed by females in rural and farm households. In addition, the Tripsy supported community development program supports the work of almost 2,000 community groups, which includes many female members, working to address issues from agriculture to environment to social isolation. And given the challenges of the last year, I congratulate the many rural women for the roles they have played in supporting the more vulnerable members of society throughout the COVID-19 challenge. More specifically, DERA provides support of some £75,000 uh, per annum uh, towards the women in disadvantaged and rural areas strand of the Regional Infrastructure Stru Pro Program Support Program. And I'd encourage farm families and women in agriculture to take advantage of the opportunities provided under this and would further encourage them to engage with representatives groups like Northern Ireland uh, Rural Women's Network to access the support offered. Although not specific to agriculture, this programme provides a broad range of support aimed specifically at women, which includes bespoke training to groups on a range of issues, which are identified through consultation and membership surveys. Examples of training provided are the Rural Leadership Course and the Rural Women and Brexit Course. Skills development and training, covering topics including charity registration and reporting processes, funding opportunities, entrepreneurship, social isolation, and health and well-being, one-to-one -one mentoring support to group on request, covering areas such as financial service support centers or groups, support charity registration and reporting, uh, policy development. The Tripsy program also provides financial support to the Rural Support Charity. And you may have heard recently from Veronica Morris about their important work, including a helpline which offers a listening ear and a signposting service for farmers and farm families. The types of issues that rural support addresses includes financial and debt problems, inheritance issues, physical and mental health concerns, stress and bereavement issues, farming paperwork and bureaucracy. Rural support recognises the challenges for women who work outside this, their home to supplement the farm business while also taking on childcare responsibilities. And I understand they have plans to launch a support programme for women in agriculture in 2022. Rural Support's new three-year strategy focuses on providing farming families with practical support and empowering them to work together as a team to build stronger farm businesses. Rural Support's own staff are all women from rural backgrounds who understand the complexity, complexities and nuances within the farm family. Their hugely dedicated and trusted team brings a level of expertise and empathy to help farming families find solutions and to move people positively along their path, often in challenging and crisis situations. I would like to pay tribute to the vital work Rural Support undertakes and wishing them continued success in these challenging times. I feel it fitting that both women and men recognise and celebrate the significant changes which have taken place in the agricultural industry with regard to the quality of opportunity and the acknowledgement of the important role women have always played and continue to play in the sector and indeed in all parts of our society and will certainly have to play going forward. Finally, I hope that you all enjoy this evening's event and wish you every success uh, with the overall conference and look forward to the questions at a later point. Thank you, Mr. Putz. And we know we'll probably have lots of questions for the minister, so please be patient. We will put as many of them as we can to him when all our speakers have been heard. So please do, do keep sending those questions in through the Q&A button, please. The Q&A button on your screen. Thank you very much for that, Mr. Putz. And as you said, yes, I did start very young in the BBC. I think I was maybe about <laughs> 12 whenever I started. So there you yeah. go. You can work that out. <laughs> so our second speaker for this evening is Chloe Dunn. Chloe is a livestock tech marketing manager by day and a woman in agriculture advocate and PhD researcher by night. In other words, Chloe doesn't really sleep. In September 2019, she embarked upon a four-year research project to dig deeper into the role, recognition and support available for women in the UK agriculture, as well as strategies to increase the visibility and participation and how this can benefit UK farming as a whole. 
to fund her PhD project and dreams of one day becoming a tenant farmer. She also works as a community marketing manager. Chloe, you're making me very, very tired just reading that out. So Chloe, I don't know how you managed to fit in the time to get here this evening and to talk to us, but we're delighted that you did. And we can't hear to, wait to hear about your research. So Chloe, it's over to you. I think I found the unmute button, great. Um, so yeah, um, thanks very much for having me. I'm really excited to be here. So um, yeah, um, I thought I'd just start off with kind of um, a little bit of background and um, following on from that introduction from Nicola. So um, I studied agriculture um, and business management at Nottingham Uni. Um, I then did a brief stint in agri PR and journalism, and I now work as community marketing manager at Breeder, which is a free precision livestock network for beef and soon to be sheep producers. So in my free time, um, I'm also studying a research PhD at Nottingham, which is investigating how the visibility and contribution of women in UK agriculture can be supported to enhance the overall sustainability of the sector. So obviously this is quite broad, um, but it brings in a lot of aspects such as economics, social sciences and politics. Um, so I also know that research can often seem a bit boring and there can be a real disconnect between what happens in the ivory towers of academia and then the actual practical implications um, for that on farm. So that's something that I'm really conscious of trying to overcome with this research project. And the whole process has really been designed to involve and engage with industry and to be able to deliver something that is useful and actionable at the end of it. So as part of this ethos, um, I thought it could be a nice idea to make this um, presentation interactive as well. So we've got some polls set up and it'd be really great if you'd like to get involved with those as well. Um, so I guess what I'll be talking about this evening, um, a bit of an overview. Um, um, yeah, I just kind of like to try and take you on the journey of um, where I've been with the research. So talking specifically about the latest research findings um, that I've got, but also kind of talking um, about the process before this. And there are two topics I'd like to talk a little bit about before that to kind of take you through that process with me. And then hopefully by the end of it, you'll be as enthusiastic about the research um, and women working in industry as I am. So um, let's start with a poll. Um, so the first question I'd like to ask you all is, do you identify as a farmer or um, a member of the farming community? So the poll should um, pop up on your screen and then you can just click any of those answers there. Um, it's not a trick question, just um, feel free to, um, yeah, just put in whatever you think and um, we'll see what the results say. Ah, so that's great. We've got a lot of people filling in the poll and um, we'll give it a few more seconds um, and then we'll crack on with the next ones. Okay, that doesn't look like it's going up anymore. So you can share the results. So we've got um, 22, uh, 21 people identifying as a farmer. 22 identifying as a member of a farming community and four people as neither. So that's great. Um, okay, so, oh, I don't know how to get this off. Um, okay, I think close that. Right, so now we've eased you in. Um, the next question that I wanted to ask you is do you identify as a feminist? So um, the poll should have popped up on your screen again. Um, if you're not sure, just kind of go with your gut. Um, it's just a bit of fun and the meaning will all become clear in a second. So it'd be interesting to see what you folks think. Okay. Right, so I'll just, uh, there's a few more coming in. Okay, so we just end the poll here. So here we've got just 12 people this time saying yes, and the majority of people, 33, saying no. Okay, so that's great. That is hope, that's what I was hoping for, um, for the rest of the presentation to make as much sense. So my reason for asking this is that through this research, I've become a lot more aware that there can be a real stigma around feminism. And 
focusing anything specifically on one gender. So that's something I'm really keen to look into as part of the engagement aspect of my research. So I've got this analogy that I'd like to share with you and see what you think about it. So, one sec. Um, so I propose that there's actually more in common between farming and feminism um, than we first might think. So as farmers or members of the farming community, I think it's fair to say that it is a really great community. The people within it understand and support each other and farmers really do care about their animals, welfare and the environment. I think it's also fair to say that there can be a tiny minority of people who maybe don't represent this so well. And the big problem is that there can be a large disconnect between farming and the outside world, which makes it too easy for people who aren't involved with the everyday of farming to become misinformed and therefore have a negative perception of the industry as a result of this. So on this slide, like we can see, this is not what farming is about, but this is sometimes how farming is portrayed. Now, I'd like to propose that this is actually very similar to feminism. So throughout society, there's a lot of stigma attached to this word, and it often conjures up images of angry women who hate men. They don't want equality, they just want men to suffer. But like with negative farming press, does this picture really represent what is going on? What actually is feminism? So the actual definition of feminism is the belief in the political, economic and social equality of both sexes. So that isn't saying women are better than men or they want to cause any disadvantage to men at all. It's essentially about leveling a playing field in a society where things haven't always been that equal. So this is well illustrated throughout the evolution of feminism where women have campaigned for the right to vote, the right to be paid the same for doing the same job. And most recently, this focus has shifted more towards empowerment and intersectionality. So intersectionality is about making the movement of equality accessible and beneficial to everyone. And I think really integral to this is including men in these conversations. In fact, striving for equality and breaking down prescribed gender norms throughout society is clearly beneficial to men too, who often, as we know, their whole lives, society is told to be strong, stoic, independent, the breadwinner, all while showing their emotion. And that is a massive and unsustainable burden to carry. So men absolutely can and should be feminists too. In fact, anyone who already believes in gender equality is actually already the definition of a feminist. So another kind of question that I just wanted to kind of quickly talk about with regards to this research um, and that I've encountered when talking about equality is does equal equal the same? So I found that by focusing research or initiatives specifically on women, you can get comments like, well, surely that is just reverse sexism. Or if you really want equality, we shouldn't be talking about gender differences. We shouldn't be singling women out. We should all be the same. So although well-intentioned, what these people fail to realize is that equality doesn't equal the same. So just using biological aspects as an example, rather than social aspects to illustrate this point, women are different from men biologically. We have different hormones, which affect our whole development. We have different reproductive organs and child-making abilities. And on average, our size, shape and actual tissue composition is different. So how does this play out in a society where the male body is often taken as the default? Well, women actually have a 47% higher chance of severe injury in the event of a car accident. Why? Because on average, most cars are designed for the measurements of a default average male. And so are most crash testimonies. Another shocking statistic is that most medical trials actually fail to account for sex differences and instead, again, use a male body as a default. An example is heart attacks. And as a result of higher understanding of male rather than female heart attack symptoms, women are 40% more likely to receive a wrong initial diagnosis and in turn have a 70% higher risk of dying. So although this sounds quite morbid, my point here is saying that people are the same and not acknowledging differences, however well-meaning that may be. 
can actually take us further away from the goal of equality. Therefore, it's essential that we have research and events which are focused on women. It isn't asking for special treatment. It's not trying to put a downer on men. It is literally focusing on leveling the playing field and actually making sure that 50% of the society have equal, equal opportunities to the rest of the population can only be a good thing for society as a whole. So what about the data for agriculture? Um, so I think it's fair to say for anyone outside of farming that farming can still look like a pretty male dominated industry. But what happens when we start to break down the data? Well, as Edwin alluded to earlier, women have always been part of farming. It's just that their contribution hasn't always been the headline news. In fact, women actually represent 52% of UK family farm workers. That is over half, but this is where the economic visibility and decision-making power comes in. They only represent 15% of both farm holders and managers. Women are also disproportionately represented within the lowest income farms and only hold minority representation within the highest income farms. There's also minimal consistent female representation within high level agricultural and policy leadership. And there's hardly any current economic research and no official policy initiatives looking into this in the UK yet, apart from in Scotland. So this research was pretty much the litmus test for beginning, uh, sorry, this, this information was pretty much the litmus test for beginning this research. And the first step then of this research project was looking at what is going on around the world. So the findings that I'm going to share with you now are based on a systematic review of literature from a load of different countries, which are similar to the UK, such as Australia, New Zealand, America, Canada, and the rest of Europe. So all of the statements that I'm making throughout this review and this presentation aren't just my own personal opinions. They're findings of a total of hundreds of papers which look into individual aspects of these points. So just very briefly kind of focusing on the methodology. So to do this review, um, we used a database for academic papers and other resources, and we put in specific search terms such as obviously women and agriculture. And this gave us a total of around 14 and a half thousand results. So this eventually got narrowed down to 184 papers, which were then brought forward and included in the lit review. So pulling together all of these insights and common themes across all of these papers, um, we broke the findings down into three main parts. So firstly, a framework characterizing the different um, attributes of different types of farm women. Secondly, a comparison of male and female farmer economic contribution and visibility. Thirdly, key barriers and potential incentives to supporting women. And then this all fed into um, a final stage, which was what does this tell us and what are the next steps? So firstly, looking at um, the framework for characterizing attributes of different types of farm women. So what we were looking at here was economic research and what quickly became very apparent is that most previous economic studies in this area solely focused upon women farmers. So those women that were in charge of the farm solely. But as so much of the social science literature was saying and the data on the previous slide and what we've um, discussed earlier alludes to, you don't have to be listed as the singular primary farmer on a bit of paper to still be heavily involved in farming. Therefore, if you only include women farmers on paper, then you are excluding a lot of the work that farm women actually do. So this is essentially what this graph um, maps in a really fluid way. It shows agricultural identity here at this side. So this is, do you identify as a farmer? Do you have an off farm identity or is it a bit of both? And both of these axes are very much sliding scales. Um, so then down here we have traditionalization of identity. So how traditional are your views and the work that you do? Do you prescribe heavily to gender norms or not really? How much decision making power do you have and how much recognition do you get for the work that you do? 
And essentially the consensus from all of this research across all of these different identity types is that the contribution that women make to the farm and to the household is so much greater than the visibility that they receive for it. So this leads us on to the next stage. And because of the lack of re economic research in this area, we just took this woman farmers segment here forwards. Um, and this was to then begin assessing if there was any differences between male and female farm performance. So um, we've got another poll set up if you'd like to um, get involved with that again. And this one is, do you think any differences exist between male and female farmers and their farm performance? So we've got answers coming in, that's great. Okay, perfect. So that's slowing down a bit. So I'm just going to end the poll again. So you should be able to see on there, we've got um, majority of people saying yes, 35 people think that there are differences between male and female farm performance, eight people no, and eight people not sure. Okay, fantastic. Close that down. Okay, so this next slide, um, shows so um, from the total 184 papers that we had, 56 papers specifically looked at different aspects of this topic. And very briefly, what we found from all of these papers is these points here on the screen, which include that women are more likely to have a smaller farm size, be involved in diversification. They're also more likely to work part time and to work off the farm and they're probably going to have a lower farm income and lower profit. But they are also more likely to be agri-tech adopters and um, be involved with um, more sustainable and environmental objectives. So I'd say finding differences here was actually quite shocking. And if we're saying that there shouldn't be differences between male and female's ability to farm, then there must be other factors at play. We need to establish causality. So these findings led us on to the next stage of the research, which was the integration of more social and societal factors, which is looking at what barriers and incentives exist. And we characterise these into three main areas, which were access to land, education and training and organisations. So I'll very quickly just take you through the headlines of those. So for access to land, the literature suggested that access to land is the single largest barrier to women's entry and participation within agriculture. Part of this is due to patriarchal succession and a 2014 Farmers Weekly survey revealed that 61% of female respondents considered themselves rarely or never treated equally when it comes to succession. Another key area is marriage and the same survey found that a quarter of women married into farming versus only 2% of men. Now these two points link to control of resources, which is really important because ownership of land correlates with considerable economic resources and facilitates access to other resources, including capital, infrastructure, training and networks. But there is good news. So for first generation farmers who don't already own land, it's indicated that there isn't so much of a gendered influence. It's also said that traditional patterns of succession may be weakening, and there is a range of alternative economic arrangements, including joint farming ventures, share farming, and land matching schemes, which have been demonstrated to increase women's access to land and resources. As a result, when women do achieve land ownership status, this also appears to encourage their participation in economic activities, and they gain greater visibility. So that is really good news. Um, then quickly looking at education and organisations. So these papers found that women were likely to be associated with lower participation in practical agricultural training and education, but they do have high levels of general education. And through engaging in more off farm work, they also gain training and qualifications through this. It was also really well documented throughout the literature that women weren't well represented within, org, um, within agricultural organisations leadership. 
and represent both a high proportion of lower economic status workers and hold minimal representation at the highest economic, managerial and executive positions. So yes, there are some high profile women leaders, but this is kind of looking more at representation and data as a whole of who is consistently at the table throughout organisations, where they are and what boardrooms they're in. So the biggest part of all this is then looking at why and answering questions such as what kind of training initiatives need to be developed? How is this communicated? What can we do to support more women? And do all of these factors link together and impact each other? So this is what my research said is basically that all of these things in a lot more detail um, do impact each other and laid out all of the arguments for this. So. The next part of the research will be focusing on establishing causality of gender differences upon things like farm performance and then how to address this. We'll also be looking at how to develop and communicate better training procedures within organisations and raising general support and awareness, as well as the mobilisation of women to engage with this. So to do this, we'll be running um, these global findings against UK um, government data to identify data gaps. I'll then be conducting my own focus groups and research um, and surveys to kind of gather that data um, that is more recent. Um, we'll then be analysing it and making recommendations and working on some exciting projects to engage with women and actually make a tangible difference. So I'll be starting to put um, the more in-depth findings of this paper out there, writing blogs and social content, which will go into more detail. So if you are interested in following that or getting involved with any of it, please do get in touch and connect. Um, I'd also really like to give a massive shout out to the charities that have come on board and supported this so far, providing funding um, to help towards the research. And um, specifically NFU Mutual, who are also sponsoring this event, um, I received their Centenary Award, which covered 75% of my course fees and really made this research possible in the first place. So the closing date for the next intake of that is actually the 30th of April for any of the postgraduate students who may be interested in that I'd really recommend taking a look. So if you are considering applying for the Centenary Award or have any of the questions about the research um, please do get in touch and um, put some questions in as well. Uh, thank you very much for listening. I'll stop sharing my screen. <laughs> Thank you very much for that, Chloe. And um, don't worry about uh, pressing all those buttons. We can get very, very confused about that. But absolutely fascinating stuff there, Chloe. And great to hear about all your research. Um, I think it's the first time that we've I've uh, seen a question posed um, about farming. And then the very next question is, do you think you're, think you're a feminist? So that's a first for me, but I have to say that was great. Also really interesting whenever you talked about, um, about cars being designed uh, for the average man, uh, which was a startling fact to hear. And also that uh, fact about heart attacks, which is actually very, very true um, that we do know the symptoms of a heart attack, but they normally do relate to the male symptoms of a heart attack. And uh, whenever women experience the first initial stages of a heart attack, they are completely different. So Chloe, thank you very much for shining a light on that too. Now we have another speaker uh, to talk to you this evening and last, but she is certainly not least at all. It's the very talented Dr. Esther Skelly Smith. Now Esther is an equine veterinary surgeon, a sheep farmer, a horse breeder, and small business owner. And she's another one that doesn't really sleep or it doesn't seem to sleep an awful lot. Esther graduated from Nottingham Vet School in 2012 and commenced working at the Animal Health Trust in Newmarket. She returned to Northern Ireland and commenced working in mixed veterinary practice in County Antrim. She identified a gap in veterinary services and launched Ireland's first equine veterinary referral service dedicated to providing an integrated approach to the veterinary treatment and care of horses. In 2019, she was rightly awarded the Woman in Business Northern Ireland Award for Outstanding Innovation. Congratulations for that, Esther. On her return to Northern Ireland, she established a sheep breeding enterprise on her family farm, which now consists of a commercial flock and three smaller pedigree flocks, which she manages alongside her mother, Louise, and husband, Timothy. Now, Esther, we are very much looking forward to your input into the seminar this evening. 
and we hope to hear more about those pedigree flocks as well. And Esther, please do tell us more about what you want to speak about this evening. Thank you, Nicola. Um, really hard act to follow after Chloe's fabulous presentation. Um, but I just want to take a moment to thank the Ulster Farmers Union and Women in Agriculture for inviting me to share this evening. Um, it was when I was asked to share, I was wondering what is the best thing to talk to you about this evening? And I thought I would start um, by telling you my story and my career path to date. As Nicola has already told you, I graduated from Nottingham Vet School and the Nottingham uh, University is being well represented this evening. And I'm also an internationally veterinary or an internationally accredited veterinary chiropractor. I have uh, postgraduate qualifications in Western veterinary acupuncture and chronic pain management. I sit on the British Veterinary Association in London. I'm their Northern Ireland regional representative and I'm on the North of Ireland Veterinary Association Council as well. I also sit on the College Advisory Group for CAFRI. So we're going to have a look at my journey and how I got to where I am today. We're going to focus a few things or a few lessons that I have learned along the way and I'm just going to share some thoughts and reflections. So I grew up on our family farm in Catesbridge in County Down. Um, both my parents worked off the farm and farm part time and we had bull beef as I was growing up. As a teenager, um, we um, stopped having bull beef and the farm was mostly arable for a period of time and rented out. And um, but I do have generations of farmers on both sides. And so that you could say that farming has always been in my blood and my love for animals has always been there too. Currently, we have this is the team as I talk about. We have my husband and myself. We work at home on the farm. Uh, Timothy my, is my husband, Louise, my mother has taken early retirement from public service and my father still works as a joiner and works part time on the farm. Like every story, we all have our inspirations and we all have people that have greatly influenced us in our choices in life and in our interests. We, I'm just going to talk about the people in these pictures. On the left, you have my grandfather, ha Hubert Haddon, and his wife, Florence Haddon, my granny. And uh, there they are with me on the farm when I was young. And as you can see, as we go through um, in the middle or this third picture across, this is them at my graduation um, shortly before my grandmother passed away. And then, of course, one of the major influences in my life is the powerhouse that is my mother. Um, she's had a pretty amazing career herself and has been a great influencer and in telling me I can always do what I want to do and never take no for an answer and uh, don't be afraid to step out. But we have these influencers in our lives and it's important to acknowledge tonight when we're talking about women in agriculture, that it's not just women, it's also men that influence us. And my grandfather and granny had four girls and they taught them that it was important to go after what you want. And while they themselves didn't have a huge education, they encouraged their young uh, daughters to go into and further their own education. And they were a great supporter to me. I remember coming home to study for my vet school finals in Granny and Granda's dining room. And while Granny said my parasitology <laughs> um, nearly put her head away, she was there with a cup of tea and a great encouragement as we went along. So where are we today? So I've already said that the farm stopped having animals on it or farm animals on it for a period of time. And, um, but I have always had a passion and an interest in horses and much to my parents despair, I never stopped talking about horses. So they had to think, um, eventually allow me to go riding and um, eventually um, we got into breeding horses. But when I, um, during vet school, I decided I really missed farming and I started breeding sheep. And we'll talk a wee bit about that. We also have 
Shanahan Veterinary Services on the farm. My clinic is here. We have a new business which started in March last year called SVS Equine. We have the horses I've alluded to and we also have a smaller hobby business called Shanahan Photography. So on the farm today, we have over 200 ewes and we're actually in the middle of lambing. We're down to our last 28 this evening. Um, and we have three uh, pedigree, smaller pedigree flocks and uh, one larger commercial flock. But if you look at the top picture in the middle where there is five sheep, our ewe lambs, these were the beginnings um, quite a few years ago when I started back into sheep. And I want to just highlight one in particular is the little black faced Clun Forest cross at the very back. We nicknamed her the Clunny and she's still with us today. She is 14 years of age today and has 13 sets of doubles and is still looking as well as she did many years ago. So this sparked my interest in Clun Forest sheep and in their longevity and their hardiness and their ease of lambing. And now we have quite a considerable flock of purebred clun forests and we've imported um, rams from Wales and different bloodlines and also purchased from other breeders here in Ireland. We also have a smaller pedigree flock of blue-faced Leicesters and Charlies. And the reason I haven't put my mother's picture here in the middle is she took early retirement, as I said, and she now manages a lot of the day-to-day -day work on the farm when we are out um, working during the day. So horses and animal welfare have always been a passion. So after graduating from Nottingham Vet School, I went on to work at the Animal Health Trust in Newmarket. I worked under um, one of the top orthopedic and lameness specialists in the world, Dr. Sue Dyson. And that was a hugely inspiring time because I, I learned a lot from her um, in her way of dealing with cases and learning to look and stand back and observe how things um, and worked and how we need to improve our understanding through research, but clinically based research as well. And after my time there, I came home and worked as an equine vet in a mixed practice. And it was lovely working in general practice as well. And I had a lot of fun with farmers and um, their animals. And then from there, as I was thinking about where my career was going to go, I moved to a part time post at the equine dental clinic um, where it was all equine dentistry. So um, there's myself and another vet worked there. And um, <coughs> excuse me. And uh, I worked part time there while doing further qualifications in veterinary chiropractic and acupuncture and different stuff like that. And um, at the same time, I took on a role for Holistic Pet NI, which offers referral services in a few of the small animal hospitals here in Northern Ireland. And I managed um, the pain and rehab clinics for both Cedar Grove Veterinary Hospital in Belfast and Crumlin House in Hillsborough. So over my career, I was starting to think where, where what did I enjoy and where do I go next? And what, what is my true passion as a vet? And there was things I missed about my time in Newmarket in general practice. And I also became aware that we need to take a bigger or a whole horse approach, take a step back and look at horses differently when it comes to their performance and injury prevention and how we manage them and treat their welfare. And in 2017, I launched um, Shanahan Veterinary Services. And the whole premise behind Shanahan Veterinary Services is that we take a whole horse approach. Um, this is a combination of integrative veterinary medicine, which is more traditional veterinary medicine, combining with dentistry and acupuncture and chiropractic work and pain management, laser therapy, performance optimization, rehabilitation plans, and all of that. So what we're aiming to do is get into prevention rather than a firefighting mode, picking up injuries in performance horses and leisure horses sooner. So we have a higher quality of welfare for those animals, partly because we know we have a problem in the equine industry about recognizing lameness on 
on when it is too late. And so what we want to do is improve our ability to pick up problems and deal with them sooner. And as I've said, that is the whole sort of integrative approach. But this is a women in agriculture event, so we'll not labour on the equine side too long. But um, just to follow up, I also then initially I started out on the road um, and it was all out of a van. And now I have a clinic uh, on our farm. We converted a an old bar and um, from there I'm now partially clinic based and partly um, road based. And I see referrals from all across Ireland. And as Nicola mentioned, um, I was very shocked to receive the Women in Business Award in 2019. And I would just encourage all full members of the Ulster Farmers Union um, that are to get involved with the Women in Business. They are, Ulster Farmers Union is a partner of Women in Business and um, you therefore have free access to all the Women in Business resources. And so, when I was nominated um, as a finalist, I went on a finalist retreat down to the Virgin in Dublin and spent time with these really inspirational women. And so I was very much looking forward to the finals dinner because I knew I was definitely not getting the award and um, I was able to enjoy my dinner. Needless to say, it was a bit of a shock when they actually did call um, my name. But what it has done is it has given me a lot of encouragement about the type of work we're doing here at Shanahan Veterinary Services, but also it has introduced me to some really amazing and influential women. And I would encourage you to get involved if you can. So I've mentioned Tim, my husband, he is uh, or was a uh, um, senior analyst at Almac in the pharma services division. And we had this ambition as a couple that we would both work from the farm and make more use of the farm and its assets that we had at home. And his scientific background and my interest in us always having evidence-based approaches to how we do things and good scientific background, we realized there was a gap in a market for in the equine industry for a platform that had really good scientifically based products. So the clients know when they come onto that platform, they are buying products that have peer reviewed evidence or good scientific backing. So great timing, he launched that, we launched that in March 2020 and his last full week in Almac was the first week of lockdown. But I'm very blessed and grateful to say that it has been a really great year despite every, the difficulties with COVID and Brexit. And what started off as one or two orders a day and us being very excited, uh, we're now developing our European distribution side as well. We Brexit has brought opportunities for Northern Ireland. I know there is difficulties, but we are now distributing throughout Europe for UK based product lines. So, and his first pallet to France has recently gone and he's shipping to Germany and Spain and um, a variety of other European countries. So within a year that has brought us both back to working on the farm and working from the farm. As I mentioned, um, and you're getting the idea, horses are a huge part of my life. And um, as I said, uh, Granda would have called them profit eaters. Mom and dad weren't that keen. Um, but a very persistent Esther eventually got her way to go riding when she was about eight or nine. And um, a good family friend then encouraged my parents to buy me an Irish draft foal. That Irish draft foal is the lady, the white mare that you can see in the background here at Balmoral and here in the picture down in the right. And she was our foundation brood mare for our horse enterprise. Tilly um, was with us for 23 years, so I'm giving away my age, and she died, unfortunately, this year. But we now have four generations of champions out of Tilly, and um, she has horses all around the world, including America, Canada, um, and a variety of European countries. And what is really lovely, as you can see here in the picture of, Bal of the old Balmoral, she was the last champion broodmare at Balmoral. Her daughter was the reserve champion, her foal was champion, and her grandson was reserve champion. 
And um, what is the nice fact of the night is her great granny was the first mayor to win it um, way back in the day. And she finalised um, she finalised the lineage with closing of the old Balmoral. I've also mentioned um, it's more of a hobby business, but it takes up a, a brave bit of time, <laughs> um, is that Tim has also uh, diversified his hobby of photography into landscape and nature photography business. And um, what's really lovely about that is he, uh, when we post COVID, hopefully we'll get back out, but he attends markets and agricultural shows and he takes lots of nice pictures of sheep and different things like that. Some things that are a wee bit unique um, and it's just a lovely outlet. So I've told you a wee bit about what I do, but I want to just talk a wee bit about some of the lessons that I have learned and what I have hoped for the future of the industry here for the agricultural industry. I think it's really keen to point out that no two journeys are the same for any of us. Um, I think I would encourage everybody to take every opportunity. And I know that's very easy to say, but if you'd have told me 15 years ago, I would be where I am today, I would have probably laughed. Every door that opens, I would encourage you to take it. And I think it's important to surround yourself by people who encourage you along. Um, we know, we talk, I've talked about those influencers. Not everybody has those good family supports, but there's lots of places where you can get that support like all the schemes, some of the schemes Edwin mentioned and some of the places Chloe has talked about and uh, the women in business. And I would encourage people to be kind and to support each other. A rising tide does lift many ships. And I think we do have an opportunity to bring everybody along with us. Farming really does give you very transferable skills. I have no doubt I would not have been as a good a vet without what I did when I was growing up and learnt. You know, I learned a lot of things from the farm when we had cattle, from an arable point of view. I learned a lot of things from my grandfather's farm, sheep farm in Scotland. Um, and it's, I think we, I think we do um, pick up a lot of very transferable life skills. And I think that is one of the benefits young people have growing up on a farm. Uh, one of uh, we take regularly take placement students for lambing and different things like that and one of the students who hadn't been on a full-time uh, sheep farm said every kid should spend time on a farm and I think that is hugely important. I think um, it's important to stay connected and network with fellow uh, women and men in agriculture just to find out what's going on. And I think I would be really keen to say, follow your dream. You know, it's really important to be passionate about what you're doing and to enjoy what you're doing and where you can have an influence for good. But as Chloe has alluded to, culture does have um, huge impacts. But we're not alone as women. And I think what I want to emphasize this is taken from my experience. I've already mentioned my grandfather and um, he uh, was one of 13 and he was the youngest son. And his, he has told me or told me on many occasions about his own family and upgrowing, upbringing. And one of the things he told me about was he wasn't the first son and he was told by his father he had no main prospects other than to be a farm hand. And in fact, he had a real passion for farming and he turned out to be, in my opinion, one of the most successful out of that family in farming. He went on to own a number of farms, including in Scotland, and to be a successful businessman. And he started out with nothing. Him and Granny basically had nothing to their name. So what I would encourage you is if you are a woman or a man that is interested in farming, there will be a way. I know it's difficult, but you can do it. And there is stuff out there to help you. And my point from this is that in a culture where quite often it's the oldest boy or the boy in a family where there's succession, I think we need to change that culture. And yes, it is getting lower, but I still think it's there. We need to really take a step back and say, who is the right person for this job? Whether it's a younger son or daughter, whether it's somebody completely outside the family. But I would be encouraging people to start talking about succession early. 
And women in particular should be empowered and encouraged to be if they are the best person for the job. And we do have a tremendous resource to future-proof our industry with our women. We don't tap into it enough. Yes, they're the backbone of the industry, but we don't talk about it enough as we've already discussed. But we're not the only industry that has issues. I'm part of the veterinary industry. We have a huge amount of women. In fact, women are the majority of the industry. But we do know that there is often unconscious bias and, and gender bias. So what can we learn from the industry that I'm part of? So this research from BVA and the University of Exeter discussed gender discrimination in the veterinary profession. And ironically, as it says here in the slide, it's not those who, um, it's not face-to-face -face discrimination, it's those who think women don't face discrimination are the most likely to, discrimin to discriminate. In this study or in this group of studies, one of the things they did do was have a questionnaire. And that questionnaire set up a group of profiles, male, female, with similar levels of um, qualifications or experience and different things like that. And they ruled out bias from a scientific point of view by not putting them side by side. And we know from that study, traditionally, women, they peer or people or in the profession, colleagues in the profession, would have paid the woman less and would have respected her opinion less. Um, and I think we need to be very aware that there is a discrimination bias on gender, even when we don't think it's there. So we do have a challenge there. So is the future of farming female? I, as has already been said, the backbone of agriculture in Northern Ireland, I believe, has always been women. They've had secondary and supportive roles and often haven't been acknowledged for their vital um, role that they've played. And things are changing. We are, as Edwin has alluded to, we are seeing a greater representation and we have a number of very high profile women that are doing very good jobs. Um, and um, <clears throat> we do know, as Edwin said, that there is 28.4% of agricultural students in CAFRI that are female in the, just in the agricultural section. But is that enough? Is that really enough when we are looking at an industry that is struggling for workforce? I'm leaving that there as a question and I, do th I think it's not enough, um, but I'm encouraged to see it improving. Women really do need to be encouraged and empowered to take the lead. Um, the stats I've been given today was that across the board of the UFU overarching committees and policy committees, only 11% are females. Now, I know that will hopefully improve after the AGMs, but that is too small a number, in my opinion. And I think we have a duty to keep looking and keep encouraging um, us to look at the vital role women have in agriculture. And I think, as already mentioned, Scotland had a fantastic ta task force for the women in agriculture there. And I do think it's time we had a task force here in Northern Ireland. And I would encourage Minister Poots to consider that. So I'm going to finish with the words of Professor Sally Shortle. The long term survival of farming depends on making the most of every resource we have at our disposal and elevating the position, role and voice of women is going to be critical to making this happen. Thank you very much. Esther, thank you very much uh, for giving that very personal talk. Um, I greatly appreciate all those wonderful family photographs and giving us a glimpse into your family life there. It was lovely to see the horses, you and your wedding dress and your grandparents and everything. Thank you very much for showing us that. Um, I also want to say that I believe you had a photograph there of Joyce Campbell up just in one of your closing slides there. Um, she's a very inspirational uh, female farmer. And I was very lucky to speak to Joyce at the last Women in Agriculture conference that we had here, actually the last and the first that we had in person uh, in Ballymena uh, in 2019. And she told me about her very personal story 
about having to uh, leave university to come back to the farm because of a family tragedy. And she was told that she was allowed to look after the farm until her brother was able to take over, which would be about six years. Now, she did say after those six years, she held on to that farm. So good on her. And she's doing an excellent job. And she does feature in quite a lot of the farming programs that we see at the moment. So Esther, thank you very much for that chat. Uh, so we're now going to open it up now to our question and answer session. You've heard from all our wonderful speakers this evening. I know we've had loads of questions coming in. Uh, we're going to start first with uh, the minister. So can I ask every, all our panellists to turn on their mics and to turn on their visual screens as well, please, just so that we can see you. OK, Chloe, Chloe, if you can unmute yourself as well. Yeah. That's lovely. OK, so we have um, a first question coming in here. Minister Putz, uh, it's for you. Um, wanting to know uh, how you will encourage more women to enter the agriculture industry and what you will do to support them. I think the opportunities um, for women has never been greater in agriculture. If, if I fall back to whenever my father was growing up, I remember him telling about the guy leaving around um, seed and it to carry 16 stone bags up to a loft. And phys physically, it was always more the men ended up doing that kind of work. It was, in my opinion, it was work that nobody should have been asked to do in, in, in many instances. Uh, but because men tended to be physically stronger, more men tended to go into farming. We, we're now in a, in a circumstance where um, technology is, is having a much greater role to play in farming. Uh, and other skills are much more uh, prevalent in farming and skills uh, very, where, where women are actually uh, very adept um, at um, embracing. So we look, for example, at um, a lot of our dairy farms now as they switch more to um, robotic milking. Uh, that involves a lot of detail and you know, a lot of attention to detail. We look at the, the chicken farms and again, the attention to detail that is required. And I have always found personally, you know, on, on our own farm, uh, that the females um, on the farm were always much more adept at that attention to detail. So I think that the opportunities um, in modern farming are much greater. Um, the machinery is much more manageable. We're looking at GPS systems now um, uh, for, for, for applying the right um, quantities to, to crops. And again, um, having good technological skills, which many of our, our um, ladies have, um, are hugely beneficial in that aspect as opposed to some old um, tractor where you could hardly steer because it's so heavy. So I think the opportunities are great as farming changes. Um, I think that farming used to be seen as being very smelly and unfashionable and not sort of something that um, any modern woman would want to be involved with. Uh, but we see farming on television all the time now and um, lots of women involved with. And, uh, you know, in particular for, for jobs like lambing sheep, women are absolutely brilliant um, because their hands are that bit smaller and they, they have a, 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 an ability to, to, to do those things to get the freight, young lambs started and all of that there. So there, I just think that farming today lends itself um, to it uh, better uh, than it would have a number of generations ago. So then the second element of that is how do we actually encourage it? And I do think that farming is becoming something which is considerably more fashionable than it was years ago. Uh, and something that um, we should be going out and holding our heads up high that we're, that we're farmers. It's not some, some job for numpties. It's a job for people who have knowledge, who have skill, who have capacity, um, who have tenacity, um, who recognise um, a crisis and deals with that crisis. Somebody mentioned the, the skills that are, I think it was Esther, the skills that were adaptable from farming to other things. Virtually every day, whenever I, I was told on the farm, there was a crisis of some kind, whether it be a cow calf with difficulty or, or whatever it happened to be, and equipment breaking or whatever. <clears throat> and you learn to deal with crises. And if you can deal with small crises, you can deal with big crises. 
So in the role that I have now, um, there's regularly crisis come up. Crisis management, the same, um, same systems, same patterns apply, irrespective of whether they're small crises or large crises. So I do think that it's an industry that we can all be proud of. And I think it's an industry that um, we certainly want more women um, to be in. And women can be proud to be farmers because they're technologists. They're, they're, there's just so many th good things uh, that can be said about being in farming today. Edwin, I'm, I'm going to follow up on that because um, there was a specific point there about what you're going to do to support them. And another uh, question here, and also following on from what Esther said at the very, very end of her uh, conversation was that she said that there should be a task force for women in agriculture here and that might be a way to support them and a very a relevant question came in off the back of that and said in 2018 the Scottish Women in Agriculture Task Force were awarded a quarter of a million pounds from government to help break down barriers which limits women impact in agriculture sector should um, DERA be providing funding for Northern Ireland women so those two questions are linked Esther has asked you a direct question and again this other person is asking you a question yeah. and then we're asking about this task force so it, it, yes or no really answer well, absolutely no problem i'm very happy to to give that serious consideration um and obviously we don't we don't decide to hand out a quarter of a million pounds just a, a, on a on a webinar but oh no 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 ed when i've seen all those press releases coming out with all that money you've been handing out recently i'm sure that there's a quarter of a million in there for women I go, you never know what we'd find out find underneath the mattress, you know. But anyway, we, we, we will certainly give it our serious consideration. Um, one of the things that, that I want to see happen in Northern Ireland is a, a veterinary school. And Esther indicated that there's now more uh, female vets than there is male vets. And again, um, I was actually in the vets this morning, uh, working with one of the, the female vets, done her job superbly well. Um, so, you know, re recognizing those skills and, and capacity and knowledge is, is, is a very important step. And this nonsense that um, women aren't able to do certain jobs is just a nonsense. I'll tell you a story. Um, we, we had a, a lady in church who volunteered to drive the bus and one of the older men um, indicated, would she be capable of driving that bus? And she says... And her response was, well, I'm driving an ambulance every day in emergency situations, so I think you can drive a church minibus. So we need to knock that sort of nonsense on the head and ha actually have recognition that, that you know, people, people are skillful, you know, for, for, for in what they are, irrespective of their gender. Um, Chloe, I, I want to ask uh, you a question just off the back of what you were saying. Um, you were saying about those identities whenever it came to farming. Um, a lot of it, you know, you were saying that females were not visible when it came to the farming roles. Now, from what I can hear from Esther, um, women do take up, um, if I could say, higher educational roles within farming and maybe not so much the hands on whenever it comes to taking over the farm. Um, why, why do you think that is? And do you think that uh, that is a problem? Um, yeah, so I'd say it's kind of probably a combination of factors as well. So like linked with the, the visibility. So kind of saying that there, there are a lot of women um, engaging in higher education and being really well represented there. But then how does that actually translate to being on the farm? Um, and I think there's, there's two aspects with that in kind of the linking to the visibility of it so are these women actually engaged on farm and it's because they aren't listed as the primary farmer that um, this contribution isn't recognized and a big part of that is kind of off farm work and part time work so um, kind of even just anecdotally like how many women kind of uh, involved with the farm unpaid labor on the farm um, and then the male is still the head of um, the farming household, but that woman is going out, she's probably um, maybe working in a different sector or working in um, an agricultural industry that isn't practical farming. And um, that economic visibility then for the contribution that that makes to the farm and the farming household 
that isn't recognised through agricultural production and the male head of the family. So um, I think there's a lot of kind of data gaps with that in actually seeing that flow of economic contribution and then in turn the visibility that that gains. Because there are quite a lot of women who live, work on farms, who are quite happy with the role that they've been given, sort of pushing back on, on what you've said, that are quite happy with the role that they've been given. They like to be there. They like to, to as Edwin said, his mother made a breakfast for 16 workers, are there for the lunchtime rush, are there to look after the 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 workings, the day-to-day -day workings of the farm, and are quite happy not to be visible. So I'm very conscious that we're not you know, doing those women down. Yeah, no, absolutely. And that's kind of um, what obviously the paper goes into a lot more detail than I had kind of time to talk about this evening. Um, and that's why we've made that framework because um, what we noticed is a lot of the economic research because there is those data gaps and because there is so many individual situations and so much of it is linked with family that by only focusing on women farmers, that is that saying that is that's what everyone should be because that that might not be what everyone wants to be but then is it fair that all of these other roles aren't acknowledged as well so it's trying to develop that framework which actually acknowledges it is a whole spectrum and there's a whole um variety of work that women undertake and that is recognized in different ways um, so yeah, it's trying trying to bring together those very disparate areas that there's not a lot of research and there's not a lot of data collection with, and um, just just a way to map that and recognise all of those different contributions. Yeah, and um, I acknowledge that you you know you had a very limited amount of time. I could have listened to you for double the amount of time, Chloe. Um, Esther, um, I noticed. Or a note that whenever you were talking, you said that you had a position within CAFRI um, and you also then did um, highlight that there's only 28% of females there. Uh, having that position within CAFRI, what do you think that you could do to increase that percentage? Two things. I'm their equine expert, but that doesn't get me off the uh, hook. I do think it's all about the quality of opportunity not a quality of outcome. Um, so I think going back to the point about the traditional farm wife and, and those roles, there is absolutely nothing wrong with wanting to do that. And in fact, I would encourage people that want to do that, that is what they should do um, on those people that work out and be involved. Um, but it is about creating that opportunity for people that want to or be recognized. And I think there is a role CAFRI are doing a brilliant job at trying to improve it. But I think actually this is something that's actually outside CAFRI. I think we need to see it to believe it. I think you need people in these roles like Joyce Campbell-Bannerman, the Red Shepherdess, the wonderful examples we have across Northern Ireland, for them to then say, actually, this is a viable career for me as a woman. And as Edwin alluded to, in a lot of ways, modern technology makes farming more accessible to those with the differences between men and women. But having said that, going back to that point, I think, um, you know, we have vet, women vets have been working in the industry a long time. It's about smart working, not brute force um, working, but I'm kind of getting to deviating from my um, point. What can CAFRI do? I think they are already offering a wide range but we as women have a role of encouraging younger generation to come in. We have a, a responsibility to step up and be involved in leadership positions. I'm involved a lot in vet politics. And at this, you know, sometimes there's a lot of men in the room, but we actually have a role to play in that. And I've actually found them all very welcome and once you get there. And sometimes it's just about pushing the door and stepping through it. Um, so I actually think there's a role for us in the industry to step forward, as well as what CAFRI has to do. Yeah, and as you said, um, Esther, very interesting statistic you had there about 11% in the Ulster Farmers Union whenever it came to females. Uh, somebody has sent in a question here, and it says it would be great to see a female president, vice president of the UFU rather than the men who usually head up the organisation. So maybe both to yourself, Esther, and to Chloe, how do you see the future for women in farming if this is not aspirational for women to be involved in those higher echelons of organizations like the Ulster Farmers Union and elsewhere? 
sorry, go over the question again. So but basically, if, if you know, the, so this particular question, somebody saying it would be great to see somebody heading up an organization, a female heading up the organization like the Ulster Farmers Union. So how do you see for the future, the future for farming, for women in farming, if this is not an aspiration for women, that we're still only getting 11 percent in the Ulster Farmers Union? So what's what's going wrong there? Well, I think there's two things. I think we as women have a responsibility to step forward. Um, but I also think they're in these organizations, they have a responsibility to make sure that it is very welcoming and open and inclusive. And they should be looking for parity. Funny, we were discussing last night on a completely different note about the North of Ireland Betting Association. And I'm just using this as an example. Originally, traditionally, it was department vet, practical vet, because initially we couldn't get the um, main practicing vets to step on to those roles. So they created the rule that we had vice versa. So maybe there's something about how we structure these organizations to make it that we have to have more inclusive inclusivity oh I can't speak more inclusive for it maybe okay. more inclusive yeah. for women we know, what you mean. we know what you mean yeah it's quite interesting that and Chloe obviously want to draw you into this conversation too because somebody has followed up on that and they they picked up on the 11 percent too yesterday and they said that um you know that when you go to the AGMs um that you you know a lot of women are elected if they go what they're saying is and what the point they're making here in this question is how do you encourage more women to attend these meetings so they're thinking that there's maybe a gap of that there are meetings but women just don't go to them and then if they don't go to them they won't get elected so we maybe maybe you want to take up um some of the conversation here whenever it comes to the last two questions there yeah, um, yeah, so I think part of that is kind of, it's where where does the responsibility lie? Like, is it women kind of taking that initiative and going into that situation that they're previously not represented in? Or does it lie with the organisation to go out of their way um, to put measures in place to make that more feasible for women? Um, so to kind of, not to be too broad of a generalisation, but women do tend to be the, the primary caregivers. Maybe they have commitments in the evening. Is that a practical time? Is a pub a practical place um, for, the, for that to be? And um, other kind of things like we've, um, I've looked at in the research is the difference in kind of the training and experiences um, that women might have. So is there anything that that organisation can do to help with training and development that would help those people feel more equipped to step into that situation and put themselves forward? So I think it really is um, kind of a balancing act really um, between both parties, but I think it is absolutely essential. I think if you've noticed that women aren't represented somewhere, that you know it may be that shift does need to come from that side to begin bridging that gap and then it being a two-way relationship. We do know, know that we have uh, Victor Chestnut, the current president of the Ulster Farmers Union, at our part three uh, webinar of the Women in Agriculture next week. So that's maybe a question that we can put to him. Uh, for Chloe and Esther, we're getting questions coming in thick and fast here, so uh, just bear with me. It says, even though I'm a partner on a family farm business and make the majority of the decisions now, I do feel sometimes I get treated a bit differently by males and they don't want to talk to me about when to cut the silage or field related work or when to sell or buy cattle. They want to talk to the man. How do we get rid of that stigma and continue to raise the profile of women in agriculture and provide opportunities for their stories to be heard? Maybe possibly um, a responsibility of government as well. Yeah, I I actually, I understand that point. And you sometimes become very aware that um, that is the way it has been. Um, and I think that is very difficult in those situations. And that is going to come through a cultural change. That's not something that's going to change overnight. I think um, the more people that we see in the industry working in those levels, that over time will come. And I think uh, going back to my point about the task force, I think that it would be a great place to investigate what we can do. Um, it also takes, you know, I, I think you have to be very conscious when we talk about women in agriculture not to alienate men. I have hugely supportive men, men in my life. And um, going back to Chloe's point around the whole feminism issue and everything, 
and it actually takes some of those men sometimes as well to say okay this is how we're going to step back and we're going to encourage the women as well um but i think I think the onus is on us all. It's on government, us personally. It's on the organisations to actually widen the participation of women in this industry and acknowledge the role they're already making. Yeah, and um, like events like this and groups kind of like social media, Instagram especially, um, there's a fantastic um, female farming community network on there. So I think just kind of raising awareness a bit, having that conversation. And like I kind of tried to allude to in my presentation, not shying away from talking about gender and that not being seen as a bad thing or combative or something um, to kind of set people apart. It's something that we, we need to have these conversations and work together. And, and it's not um, like putting men against women, it's um, working together. And yeah, I think networking and events and the chance to talk about that and, share stories, meet people in other situations will eventually change those gender norms. And like Esther said, it, it's not gonna happen overnight, but if enough people take part in that journey, then um, it will create systematic change. Well, we might have nailed down uh, the minister to a quarter of a million pounds and a possible task force uh, for women in agriculture, as he looks at me quizzically going, I never said that. Uh, but you did say in your talk that you had 28% uh, in your top management team. That's not that great. So, you know, we're looking towards you to do a little bit better. So how could you do a little bit better with that figure? Well, as people say, Rome wasn't built in the day. It, it is considerably greater than it was even uh, five years ago or 10 years ago. So the trajectory is, is, is going the right way. I have no doubt that that will um, continue to go on that trajectory and, and over the next decade um, that will be substantially higher again. So, you know, someone mentioned there about, uh, uh, you know, ha not, you know, people, people not asking about uh, the women about when, when they want the city to cut or, or, or key, key decisions um, or, or one of the contributors there. And th that is a cultural thing that really needs to change. I think one of the issues in agriculture is it's also quite an old business. Um, so you have a lot of older older men in particular who just haven't went through that cultural change and, and, and don't recognize it. And you know that 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 is that is an area where I think what will, will change and is changing is changing dramatically. So if we have 45% of, of women in the, the department um, then you you, you would expect that that should be reflected at the senior management team within the department. In agriculture itself, I do think that um, you will see uh, more women taking up uh, the lead role and as very apparently being in the lead role. I have to say that in my mother and father's situation, mum was involved in all of the big decisions. And they, they were a couple who also started off with not, not, nothing. He was a sixth son and have to go out and buy and sell the calves and things to, to be able to afford to, to, to start farming and build it up. And she was involved in all the decisions about buying land and, and building new housing and all of that there for animals and, 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 and you know, what, what we're actually doing on the farm uh, and played a key role. I mentioned my grandmother. Whenever my grandfather was, was almost bankrupt, it was her who kept things going with, with her chicken industry and all of that there. So uh, the industriousness of, of, of women uh, is, is something that has ensured that many a farm currently exists in a family. Um, and I think that the generation that we live in will be very happy to recognise um, those contributions, recognise those skills as, as, as we move forward and recognise that women have a big role to play in agriculture and very often a leading role to play in agriculture. <clears throat> I would say that very often um, couples work as a team, um, but on the public face of it, the man is seen to be the leader of the team and it isn't necessarily the case, but, but that is how it's perceived. And uh, I know that time is ticking on here and I don't want to keep you any further. So just one very final question, I'm trying to get in as many as I can here. Um, 
Somebody wants to know, should we, now maybe this isn't a question for you, Minister Pitt, it's maybe more a question for uh, Peter Weir, uh, but you can maybe pass it on or you can work together on this one. Um, would the Minister be in favour of agriculture being added to the primary school curriculum at the same level as it is in the Southern Ireland education system, given the apparent disconnect children have on where their food comes from? Um, it's interesting to find out all your views on this, Esther, as well as Chloe, but first of all to you, uh, Mr Pitts. Yes, I would. Uh, my daughter done uh, an agricultural uh, GCSE, agricultural land use, and uh, it was very informative. Um, she was coming home and asked me all sorts of questions, and there were very good questions that, that, that she was asking. And what, what we want um, whenever young people leave school is well-rounded young people, and knowing um, where their food comes from, how it's produced, uh, and a lot of the complexities uh, that, that are associated with farming um, will do nothing but good for them. So I would love to see um, a, an element of the curriculum, uh, including land use, including agriculture. Esther, yourself? Um, yes, I'm aware that there is a GCSE, and I know there's a, a very few schools actually do it, but I do think I would be hugely in favour of it. If we look at how the profession is moving, towards a one health concept where we're looking at environment, ag, um, animal health and human health. Um, I think it's that concept should be taught from primary school right through and agricultural is part of that um, and how to do that sustainably for the future. Sometimes um, I think that the agricultural GCSE may lean a little bit on production science more than thinking about the bigger picture. So I would be keen that the whole concept be taught right from primary school right the way through. And Chloe. Yeah, I, I think that would be absolutely um, amazing. And um, so my mum is um, a primary school teacher and she's been involved with like FaceTime a farmer initiatives and um, which even when there isn't something official set up um, schools can opt into. And um, we've taken piglets and lambs in. And I think capturing children at a really young age, like primary school, is the perfect time um, to kind of get their interest um, and you can we can openly explain to them that these animals go for meat and how we care for them and they're, they're like they're sponges they soak that up and they don't question it and I think it's so good to get people on board um, with kind of the authenticity of it from being so young and then working its way throughout the rest of the curriculum and GCSE and stuff kind of as those children become consumers in their own right. Fantastic well as I mentioned there a few seconds ago, time is ticking on and we have come to the end of our evening. Thank you so very, very much for joining us. I hope you have gained so much from our seminar this evening. And thank you very much to our speakers this evening, Edwin Putz, Chloe Dunn and Esther Skelly-Smith. It has been a pleasure to hear from you and we really appreciate you giving up your valuable time to speak to us. And special mention this evening goes to Esther Scarf. She really got the branding spot on tonight and she put me to shame because I should have been sipping from my Radio Ulster mug and I will make sure that I do that in part three of our webinar. Also a big thank you to the amazing team behind this seminar who have put in so much hard work and time to bring it all together. That's Heather Stewart, Jennifer Hawks, Carol Bell, Caroline Doyle, Christine Kennedy, Denise Kelso, Heather Patterson, Marianne Buick, Sarah Morell, and Martin Malone, NFU Mutual, for their kind sponsorship. And I said this last week, any complaints or anybody I've left out, please refer to Heather Stewart. And can I remind you all that the charity we are supporting is Life Beyond, which delivers bereavement services for the farming community in Northern Ireland. The goal of Life Beyond programme is to provide a connected range of bereavement support services and activities for the farming community in Northern Ireland with the aim of improving mental, social and physical well-being of farm families who have been bereaved. If you wish to donate, details of that will be emailed to you alongside the Watch Again link. And the final part of our Women in Agriculture seminar will broadcast next Wednesday evening, that's April the 28th at 7.30, the theme Business Skills in Agriculture. And there's going to be some strange wee woman called Nicola Weir from 
BBC Northern Ireland, and she'll be speaking alongside Claire McCallion and the president of the Ulster Farmers Union, Victor Chestnut. I've heard he's great crack, so you're definitely going to have to tune in. Please make sure you register as soon as possible. So for me, Nicola Weir, and everyone here at the Ulster Farmers Union Women in Agriculture Conference, stay safe and do enjoy the rest of your evening. <laughs>